Hello students, this is your professor speaking. My name is attorney Alfredo Lopez Mayol III and I will be teaching legal medicine. Okay. So before we begin, let me read to you my favorite uh, Bible verse. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Okay. Thank you for listening to my prayer. Let's begin. So, our subject is legal medicine. Okay? By definition, legal medicine is a branch of medicine which deals with the application of medical knowledge to the purposes of law and in the administration of justice. Okay? By definition, legal medicine is a broad topic. It is a broad subject. Okay? It um, embraces uh, different kinds of aspect like the legality and the medical practice, the legal implications of um, the acts of the doctors, and the purpose of which is to help in the administration of justice okay so the scope of legal medicine is quite broad and encompassing it is the application of medical and paramedical sciences as demanded by law and the administration of justice okay now let's talk about the brief history of legal medicine So in the world worldwide scale, in 2980 BC, Imhotep, otherwise considered as the chief physician and architect of King Zoser of the Third Dynasty in Egypt, was the earliest recorded medical legal expert. Okay. So as early as um the ancient times there there were already records of medical legal activities okay Imhotep was first was the first person ever recorded with reports of a murder trial written on a clay tablet in 2200 BC the oldest code of law is the code of Hammurabi so this code of Hammurabi included legislation on adultery rape divorce incest abortion violence and etc okay in 460 to 355 BC Hippocrates discussed the lethality of wounds so Hippocrates he is also known as the father of medicine okay when you become doctors before before you can practice you must recite the Hippocratic oath okay 
as the final step on becoming a full-fledged doctor. So in 384 to 322 BC, Aristotle fixed animation of fetus at the 40th day after conception. So at this time, the philosopher Aristotle also contributed in the field of medicine by animating the fetus at the 40th day. Okay. Next, about 300 BC, Chinese Materia Medica gave information on poison like aconite, arsenic, and opium. Okay. At this time in history, 300 BC, the Chinese also contributed to the field of medicine by giving information on poisons. In 200 BC, hashish was said to be used narcotic in surgery. So at this point in history, there was already operation okay, conducted. Surgery is already conducted and hashish is used as a narcotic. The first police surgeon or forensic pathologist was Antistius. Okay, he performed the autopsy on Julius Caesar from 100 to 44 BC. Okay, Astis Antistius was the one who performed autopsy on the great Julius Caesar. So at this point in history, there is also increasing knowledge on the study of human body. In 483 until 565 AD, okay, BC means before Christ. AD means Anno Domini or after Christ, okay? Justinian mentioned that a physician is not an ordinary witness and that a physician gives judgment rather than testimony, okay? So a person named Justinian declared that a physician being a learned or being not, not being of um, knowledgeable is considered an expert witness, not just an ordinary witness. Okay, so the first textbook in legal medicine was comprised in the Constitute Criminalis Carolina. Okay, that's the first textbook in legal medicine. In 2009, Pope Innocent III issued a law providing for the appointment of doctors to the courts for the determination of the nature of wounds. Okay. In 1234 AD, Pope Gregory the Ninth produced the Nova Compilatio Decretalium, which concerned medical evidence, marriage, nullity, impotence, delivery, cesarean section, legitimacy, sexual offenses, crime against persons, and witchcraft. Okay? At this point in time, a pope, okay, part of the church compiled a book called Nova Compilatio Decratilium whereby um, different crimes were illustrated and discussed. In the 14th century, Pope John the 22nd stated the need of professionals in the courts for the diagnosis of leprosy and many medical legal documents. 
In 1575, Ambrose Pear counted legal medicine as a separate discipline, which includes abortion, infanticide, death by lightning, hanging, drowning, fine disease, distinction between anti-mortem and post-mortem wound, and poisoning by carbon monoxide and by corrosives. Okay. In 1584 to 1659, Paulus Zacchaeus, a physician, or he was the father of the forensic medicine, who published Questiones Medico Legales, which dealt with the legal aspects of wounds. In 1598, Severin Pinot worked on virginity and defloration which confirmed the existence of the hymen and that it may not rupture during sexual intercourse, okay? So in 1787 to 1853, Orfila, founder of the modern to toxicology, introduced chemical methods in toxicology, including mineral, vegetable, and animal poison in, in relation with physiology, pathology, and legal medicine. So that was the history of medicine in the world scale, okay? However, in, in the Philippines, medicine's history started in 1858, okay? In 1858, the first medical textbook, Manual de Medicina Domestica, printed by the Spanish physician Dr. Rafael Ganardi Mas on medical legal practice. Okay? So in 1871, teaching of legal medicine as an academic subject in School of Medicine of the Universidad de Santo Tomas. Okay? So, medicine is already taught in school at the time, 1871, at Santo Tomas University. In 1895, Medical Legal Laboratory was established in the city of Manila. Okay? So, at that point in history, there was already a laboratory in Manila. In 1898, American civil government preserved the Spanish forensic medicine system. Okay. In 1901, Philippine Commission formed the Provincial Insular and Municipal Board of Health in the Philippines and regulate medical legal system in full force in the administrative code. So, um, there is already inculcation of legal maxims in the practice of medicine because there was a, at this time, there was a creation of a board of health in the Philippines. In 1908, the Philippine Medical School, school started the teaching of legal medicine to fifth year students. Okay? So, in contrast, today, legal medicine and medical jurisprudence is taught in the first, in the early years of med school, okay? First year, second year, compared to the um, earlier times in the 90s and in the 80s, okay? They are taught at the fifth year. In 1919, the University of the Philippines formed the Department of Legal Medicine and Ethics with Dr. Sexto de Los Angeles as the chief. Okay. On March 10, 1922, the Philippine Legislature passed Act Number no. 1043, which provided that, that the Department of Legal Medicine, University of the Philippines, became a branch of the Department of Justice. So, 
these agencies were integrated into the Department of Justice, okay? As early as 1922. On December 10, 1937, Commonwealth Act number 181 was passed, creating the Division of Investigation under the Department of Justice. On March 3, 1939, the Department of Legal Medicine of University of the Philippines was terminated and formation of medical legal section of the Division of Investigation under the Department of Justice. Okay. On June 28, 1945, the Division of Investigation under the Department of Justice was reacted. Activated. On June 19, 1947, Republic Act Number 157, creating the Bureau of Investigation, was passed. Okay, this is the NBI, the National Bureau of Investigation. Okay, compared to the PNP, the Philippine National Police, the NBI has a national scope. Okay. This agency has a wider scope compared to our local policemen. On June 50, 1954, Republic Act 1982 for the creation of rural health unit to each municipality composed of qualified physicians to perform medical legal functions by eliminating other officers. Example, nurses, midwives, etc. So on December 23, 1975, Presidential Decree 856 was promulgated and Section 95 provides persons authorized to perform autopsies. They are first, health officers, second, Medical officers of law, enforcement agencies. Third, members of the medical staff of accredited hospitals. Okay. In this section, um, different persons, okay, are given power by law to perform autopsies. Okay. Even if you are a doctor, but you are not um, under the enumeration of this section, then you are performing illegal autopsy and you can be imprisoned. So the enumeration is exclusive. So always bear in mind that you should read the law before doing something, okay? Everything you do must be in consonance with the law. Okay. Next, autopsy shall be performed in the following cases. First, whenever required by special laws. Second, upon order of a competent court like or a mayor and a provincial or city fiscal. Third, Upon written request of police authorities. Fourth, whenever the lawyer general, provincial or city fiscal, judge, it, it, it is necessary to expose and take possession of the remains for examination to determine the cause of death. Fifth, whenever the nearest kin shall request in writing the authorities concerned to ascertain the cause of death okay so again the enumeration is exclusive you cannot just um, perform autopsy if it is not uh, written or not found in this provision of law okay medical evidence okay by definition Medical evidence as for inspection statement, the court permits required to be made before 
it by the witness okay all evidence by a witness is called an oral testimony oral evidence because they use their senses and testify in court okay all documents produced for inspection by the court are documentary e evidence they are real evidence okay because they even though they are not subjected to the senses they are the physical evidence that cannot be tainted okay next is admissibility of evidence evidence is admissible when it is relevant to the issue and it is not excluded by these rules so by the rules it means the rules of court okay evidence should be relevant to the case or the issue at hand okay you cannot just give any evidence one requirement is relevancy of evidence next when it has the tendency to prove any matter of fact next something which by logic an inference may be made as to the existence or non-existence of the fact relevancy of evidence evidence must have such a relation to the fact okay it must be related it must be relevant issues as to induce belief existence or non-existence collateral matters shall not be allowed okay it must be a direct evidence not collateral by collateral means it is indirect it is sideline sideways not direct collateral they tend in any reasonable degree to establish the probability or improbability collateral matters are different from those that do not co do not correspond with the matters okay so if you have questions my dear students just message me in the mess message box in this application okay types of evidence autoptic or real evidence those evidence which are physical in nature for example the gun okay the murder weapon next is testimonial evidence the testimony of the witness okay oral testimony next experimental evidence next documentary evidence or evidence which are written like contracts okay like deeds affidavits and etc physical evidence or real evidence autoptic or real evidence evidence made known or addressed to the senses of the court the sense of vision but is extended to what the sense of hearing taste smell and touch is perceived whenever an object has such a relation to the fact in issue as to afford reasonable ground of belief respecting to latter again autoptic or real evidence there's in an existence a situation a condition or character proved by witnesses as the court in its discretion another is indecency and impropriety evidence may may be necessary to serve the best interest of justice the court may not allow exposure of the genitalia of the victim of sexual offense to, 
to show genital and extragenital injuries suffered by the victim okay it doesn't matter if for example there is um, castration or mutilation or the crime of rape it is not necessary that the victim will show their private parts in order to prove okay the the matter okay there are expert witness like doctors they can examine the victim and then make expert um, testimony or recommendation or certification and it can be honored in trial okay repulsive objects and those offensive to sensibilities the person suffering from highly infectious and communicable disease potential danger to the life and health of a judge may not be presented okay another type of evidence is testimonial evidence a physician may be placed at the witness stand to answer questions propounded to him by counsel of parties or by the presiding officer of the court given orally in open court and under oath or affirmation okay so when you say under or under oath or affirmation it means um the person can be charged of perjury if he is lying okay that is the meaning of under oath what for example uh, like in the movies a person is holding a bible and then the witness will touch the bible and then he will tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth so witnesses can be distinguished from an ordinary witness to a to a to a to an expert witness okay experimental evidence oh. a medical witness may be required to perform certain experiments to prove a certain matter of fact must not be offensive to decency, sensibilities, and propriety. Okay. Another type of evidence is documentary evidence. Any written evidence presented by a physician in court which is relevant to the subject matter in dispute and not excluded by the rules of court. Okay. So like what i've said earlier documentary evidence contemplates documents okay contracts written agreements which is relevant to the subject matter for example the subject matter is violation of your contract employment contract so the subject matter is your employment and then the document that you will submit in court is your employment contract okay so medical document documentary evidence are sometimes there are formal written reports written opinion certificates okay it includes those um, enumerated medical documentary evidence okay formal written reports written opinions certificates deposition dying declarations methods of preserving evidence okay so at this stage um, there are uh, evidence must be preserved in order to protect their integrity so that by the time you will present it it is still useful recognizable okay so photography and sound recording 
Okay? Um, for example, a sachet of drugs. So, it is preserved through first by taking a picture. Okay? And then recording it. Like, for example, the police officer will mention that this drug is um, white, um, weighing 10 kilograms, and so on and so forth. Another uh, preserving technique in evidence is sketching, okay? Preserve the face of the culprit. Describing the culprit, description, and then testimony of the witness, okay? Making affidavits or deposition kind of evidence necessary for conviction so in order to convict the culprit you must present direct evidence which proves the fact in dispute without the aid of any inference or presumption the evidence presented corresponds to the precise to actual point at issue Another kind of evidence which can convict the accused is circumstantial evidence. The proof of fact from which taken either or collectively the existence of a particular in dispute may be inferred as necessary or probable consequence. By circumstantial evidence, it denotes or it contemplates uh, circumstance, okay? For example, uh, the shoes of the killer was left at the door, okay? For example, the owner of the shoes is Patel. The shoes of Patel was at the door of the crime scene, okay? So probably it was Patel who killed or murdered the victim. That is circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is for is for example, there's a CCTV, a video, okay, recording that Patel was murdering or killing. Okay. <laughs> for those of you who are family name are Patel, I'm sorry because most of my students, okay, I have many students who are Patel. Okay. Okay. Proof required in court of justice. So in civil cases, preponderance of evidence. So this is the quantum of proof required in proving your point or your or proving your case. Okay, preponderance of evidence in civil cases. Preponderance of evidence means the greater weight of evidence that will outweigh the evidence of the other party. So. It means that the evidence adduced as a whole by one side is superior to that of the other, okay? So, in a case, there are two parties, okay? For example, in a criminal case, people of the Philippines versus Juan de la Cruz, okay? People of the Philippines is the aggrieved party. Juan de la Cruz is the accused. Okay, the one who committed the crime. And in civil cases, plaintiff versus defendant. Okay, the plaintiff is the one who filed the case, and the defendant is the one who will answer the case. Okay, so in criminal cases, proof beyond reasonable doubt that's the quantum of evidence required in order to convict the accused okay its weight is much greater compared to preponderance of evidence the defendant is entitled to an acquittal unless his guilt is shown beyond reasonable doubt factors considered in determination which parties evidence pro preponderate okay all facts, the circumstance of the fact, okay, the judge must review 
all attending circumstance. Okay? The witness, manner of testifying, their intelligence, their means, opportunities of knowing the facts to which they are testifying, the nature of the fact to which the witness testify, the probability and improbability of the witness's testimony, the interest or want of interest of the witness, credibility of the witness so insofar as the same may legitimately appear upon trail or upon trial. The number of witnesses presented, although preponderance is not necessarily with a greater number, okay? So, if you are the judge, you must examine the entirety of the case. Examine, you must examine the attending circumstance, the witnesses, the manner on which they deliver, the man, their decorum, okay? Maybe they are lying, okay? Methods of preservation of evidence. So, we will discuss this point by point. Photography, the most practical, useful, and re reliable means of preservation, okay? Because, and easiest, because nowadays, we have smartphones, okay? So, for example, hit and run. And then, we take our smartphone, take a video, take a picture of what happened, and you can use it as evidence, okay? The object preserved is reduced in size in the picture proportionately with other objects ad adjacent or near it. Multiple copies, each of which identif identical of each other, can be produced. Identification of voice from the recording instrument may sometimes be difficult. For example, audio recording may be dependent on the speed, volume, pitch, and etc. Sketching. In the absence of any scientific evidence, a rough sketch is done to preserve the evidence, okay? There are kinds of sketch. A rough sketch, this is made at the crime scene or during examination of living or dead body. Finished sketch, a sketch prepared from the rough sketch for court presentation. Okay? Essential elements to be included in a sketch. Measurement, compass direction, essential item being investigated, scale and proportion estimation, title to explain certain marks indicated. Okay? So, if you are doing a sketch, you must uh, put legends, okay, or marks, or uh, the title to explain the sketch, okay? Next, description. This is putting into words the person or thing to be preserved, for example, okay, have you seen the killer? The witness will say, yes, he is wearing black shirt and white shoes. Okay, so it is putting into words the person or thing to be preserved. That is description. The minimum standard requirement which must be in a description of a person. Uh, skin lesions, what kind, the measurement, other descriptive information of the lesion itself, the location, the orientation, penetrating wound, punctured, stab, or gunshot, kind, shape, and location. Is there hymenal laceration in the case of rape? Okay. Location, degree, duration, complication. Was the hymenal la laceration led to infection? Okay. As a medical legal officer, you must take note of all of this.
person, those requirement in portray parlay. Okay? Mannequin method. So, in a miniature model of a scene or of a human body, indicating marks of the various aspects of the things to be preserved. Okay? So, the mannequin, mannequin method contemplates um, you make a model, a miniature model of the scene of the crime, okay, or the human body. You put marks on the various aspects of the things to be preserved. Preservation in the mind of the witness. A person who perceived something relevant for proper adjudication of a case may be a witness in court. If he has the power to transmit to others what he perceived. Special methods. Special way of treating certain types of evidence may be necessary. Some of the special ways of preservation are whole human body, embalming, okay? You put formalin to preserve the body. You, and then you embalm the body. Soft tissues, skin, muscles, visceral organs. 10% formalin solution. For blood, refrigeration, sealed bottle container, addition of chemical preservatives. For things like blood or semen, drying, placing in sealed container. For poison, placed in a sealed container. That's how you preserve those things. Kinds of evidence necessary for conviction. Okay? So, indirect evidence that which proves the fact in dispute without the aid of any inference or presumption. Circumstantial evidence, the proof of fact or facts from which taken either singly or collectively. The existence of a particular fact and dispute may be inferred as a necessary or probable consequence. So when is circumstantial evidence, evidence sufficient to produce conviction? First, when there is more than one circumstance, okay? Patel shoes is at the crime scene. Okay, Patel was seen by his neighbors. Um, near the crime scene. The color of Patel's shirt has red blood stain. Okay, these are circumstances. Okay. When the fact from which the inference are derived are proven, and when the combination of all the circumstances is is such as to produce a conviction beyond reasonable doubt. Okay. So, in the rules of court, it is it, it can be found in section 4, rule 1, 2, 3 of the rules of court. Okay, the procedure. Weight and sufficiency of evidence. Okay. Um, when you say weight, okay, it is the quantum of proof required. And sufficiency is whether or not there is sufficient evidence or relevant evidence can be used in order to convict the accused. So rule one, 133 of the rules of court, section 1, preponderance of ev evidence, how determined. So by preponderance of evidence, it contemplates the civil aspect of the case, okay? So, in civil cases, the party having the burden of proof must establish his case by a, propon by a preponderance of evidence. In determining where the preponderance or superior weight of evidence on the issues involved lies, the court may consider all the facts and circumstances of the case the witnesses manner of testifying their intelligence their means and opportunity of knowing the facts to which they tire testifying 
the nature of the facts to which they testify, the probability or improbability of their testimony, their interest or want of interest, and also their personal credibility, so, so far as the same may legitimately appear upon trial. Okay? As I judge, all of these things you must take into consideration. Okay? You must decide the case on its entirety, not just in its face value. Okay? Consider everything, the witnesses, the evidence, okay, the testimony. Section 2, proof beyond reasonable doubt. So in a criminal case, the defendant is entitled to an acquittal unless his guilt is shown beyond reasonable doubt. Proof beyond reasonable doubt does not mean such a degree of proof as excluding possibility of error produces absolute certainty. Moral certainty only is required or that degree of proof which produces conviction in an unprejudiced mind. Okay? So, proof beyond reasonable doubt is heavier, okay, compared to preponderance of evidence because um, it must be clear in the mind of the judge that this person really committed a crime. Okay? That is why you must present um evidence which must clearly point out to the commission of the crime by the accused okay so the judge will decide the case based on moral certainty okay that in his mind in his unprejudiced mind this person committed the crime Next, deception, detection, and polygraph. Okay? The knowledge of the truth is an essential requirement for the administration of criminal justice. Modern scientific methods have been devised utilizing knowledge of physiology, psychology, pharmacology, toxicology, and etc in determining whether a subject is telling the truth or not, okay? So, um, there are many devices, okay, in order to know if the person is lying or not. This, this technique is called deception detection, okay? You can, you can use equipments like a polygraph test, okay? So, so far, if you have questions, my dear student, just message me, okay? I am just in the background. I will answer all your questions. Just press the pause of my slide, and then you can ask the question. And then you can go back again. By the way, I will be giving uh, cases for you to study because I cannot you know, talk for long periods of time, you will be sleepy. So, I will give you activities. I will give you um, actual court cases and you will study it and then you will, um, because you have groups, right? You have small groups, so you will discuss it with your group and then you will submit a hard copy to me. Okay? A case digest. You will digest a case. Okay? You will, um, I will give you the case and then you will write the facts of the case and then the issue of the case and then after that you will write the decision of the Supreme Court. Okay? These cases are important for, for you so that you can understand the concepts of legal medicine, okay? Because sometimes concepts of legal medicine are hard to understand due to its technicality. So, you need to see it 
through its application okay in order for you to grasp the knowledge to grasp the concept okay let's continue so methods of deception detection which are currently being used or applied by law enforcement agencies may be classified as follows devices which record the psychophysiological response for example, use of a polygraph or, or a lie detector machine. Use of drugs that try to inhibit the inhibitor. For example, another example is the administration of truth serum. Another is hypnotism. Then by observation or by scientific interrogation. Okay, when you say scientific interrogation, you have systems of questions that will elicit responses from the perpetrator recording of the psychophysiological response when a person is under the influence of physical or an exertion or emotional like anger excitement fear lie detection etc stimuli the sympathetic will dominate and override the parasympathetic thus there will be changes in the heart rate pulse rate the blood pressure respiratory tracing psychogalvanic reflexes time of response to question voice tracing and etc okay so this device will detect these changes okay the parasympathetic nervous system works to restore things to normal when the conditions of stress have been removed. Use of a light detector or, or polygraph. So phases of the examination, there's a pretest interview and then there's the actual interrogation and recording through the instrument and then there's the post-test interrogation okay so when when you prepare the person uh, first you ask him uh, questions okay neutral questions before the actual interrogation okay in order to prepare his physiologic responses okay so this is an example of a polygraph test as you can see, the, uh, it is connected to a computer and then there are um, wires, machines attached to the hands. There's also a BP apparatus and then the person is instructed to sit and relax and then you you elicit the responses through asking questions okay through interrogation scientific interrogation pretest interview to determine whether the subject has many medical or or psychiatric condition or has used drugs that will prevent testing okay to explain to the subject the purpose of the examination to develop the test questions particularly those of the types to be asked to relieve the truthful subject of any apprehensions as well as to satisfy the, the deceptive subject as the efficiency of the technique to know any antisocial activity or criminal record of the subject okay um, you must inculcate you must put in the mind of the subject okay you must prepare the, the mind of the subject that this machine will detect any changes okay if he he is lying changes in his breathing changes in his uh, BP changes in his pressure blood pressure and then you must also ask about the background of that person because sometimes 
this person has a mental disorder that would prevent because uh, this machine, this uh, polygraph test is not really reliable, okay? Because, for example, the person is very talented in, in breathing. He is a pathological liar, very gifted in lying. So it's like when he lies, it's just normal for him or her. So the machine cannot detect that. Because the machine will only detect changes in the physiologic responses of the person. That is why you must um, you must your questioning must be designed, okay, to elicit responses that are important. Okay, you cannot just ask, "Did you kill that that person?" Uh, of course, he will, he or she will say no. Okay, that is why you must design your questioning in order to elicit the answer you want. Actual interrogation and recording. Irrelevant questions. These are questions which have no bearing to the case under investigation. For example, what color is the clouds? Okay, these are ir irrelevant questions. Okay, do you breathe air? Uh, something like that. Relevant questions. These are questions pertaining to the issue under is investigation. For example, where were you at the time when A was murdered? Okay, what were you doing at the time? Next is control questions. These are the um, questions that you design in order to e elicit a certain response. These are questions which are unrelated to the matter under investigation but are of similar nature, although less serious as compared to those relevant questions under investigation. Okay? Post-test interrogation. Post-test interrogation. The purposes of further questioning after the test are to clarify the findings, to learn if there are any other reasons for the subjects responding to irrelevant question other than the knowledge of the crime. Okay? To obtain additional information and an admission for law enforcement purposes if the result suggests deception. Another test in order to detect uh, deception is word association test. So a list of stimulus and non-stimulus words are read to the subject who is instructed to answer as quickly as possible. The answer to the question may be a yes or a no. Unlike the lie detector, the time interval between the words uttered by the examiner and the answer of the subject is recorded. Okay. So, you look at the time interval between your question and the answer of the subject. You should take note of that. When the subject is asked questions with reference to his name, address, civil status, nationality, etc., which has no relation to the subject matter of the investigation, the tendency is to answer quickly. But when a question bears some words which have to do with a criminal act, the subject allegedly committed, like knife, gun, or hammer, which was used in the killing, the tendency is to delay the answer. Use of psychological stress evaluator. So when a person speaks, there are audible voices frequencies and superimposed on these are the inaudible frequency modulations 
which are products of minute oscillation of the muscle of the voice mechanism. Such oscillations of the muscle or microtremor micro occur at the rate of 8 to 14 cycles per second and controlled by the central nervous system. So when a person is under stress as when he is lying, the microtremor in the voice utterance is moderately or completely suppressed. The degree of suppression varies inversely to the degree of psychologic stress in the speaker. Okay. The psychological stress evaluator or PSE detects measures and graphically displays the voice modulation that we cannot hear. So the procedure. First, the examiner meets the requesting party to determine the specific purpose of the examination and to begin formulation of relevant questions. A pre-test interview is conducted with the subject to help him or her feel at ease with the examiner, to provide opportunity to specify matters, to eliminate outside issues, and to review questions that will be asked. An oral test of about 12 to 15 yes or no questions is given, which is recorded on a tape recorder. The questions are a mixture of relevant and irrelevant questions. So immediately following the test or at the later time, the tape is processed to the psychological stress evaluator for analysis of the answers. If stress is indicated, the subject is given opportunity to provide additional qualification. A retest is given to verify correction and clarification. Advantages of psychological stress evaluator over the lie detector machine. So what are the advantages? It does not require the attachment of sensors to the person being tested. Okay, So as you can see in the pictures before, there are sensors which must be attached if you use a polygraph uh, machine. Okay. The testing situation need not be carefully controlled to eliminate outside distraction and normal body movement is not restricted. Truth Serum Administration of Truth Serum The term Truth Serum is a misnomer. Okay? The procedure does not make someone tell the truth and the thing administered is not a serum but is actually a drug. Okay, this is another form of eliciting or detecting deception. Okay, this is a deception detection technique application of truth serum. In the test, Hyoscine hydrobromide is given hypodermically in repeated doses until a state of delirium is induced. When the proper point is reached, the questioning begins and the subject feels a compulsion to answer the questions faithfully. He forgets his alibi which he may have built up to cover his guilt. He may give details of his acts or may even implicate others. The drug act on the brain, particularly the cortex and the encephalone, are selectively depressed in reversed order of their evolutionary development. Scopolamine may sometimes cause psychotic re reactions. Statements taken from the subject while under the influence of truth serum are, evolut are evolutionarily obtained, hence they are not admissible as evidence, okay? Because of the potential risk involved in the application of the procedure, it is seldom used by law enforcement agency, okay? 
sometimes the use of truth serum is without the participation okay without the consent of the subject so that is why it cannot be used in court it is not it is inadmissible in court narcoanalysis or narcosynthesis this method of deception detection is practically the same as that of administration of truth serum. The only difference is the drug used. Psychiatric sodium amital or sodium pentothal is administered to the subject. When the effects appear, questioning starts. It is claimed that the drug causes depression of the inhibitory mechanism of the brain and the subject talks freely. The administration of the drug and subsequent interrogation must be done by a psychiatrist with a long experience on the line. Okay, so the process of this is like in administration of truth serum, but the drug of choice is different. Sodium pentotal. Okay, it is a psych psychotic drug which if taken by the subject the brain hallucinates okay so it causes depression of the inhibitory mechanism that's why the subject talks freely the administration of the drug and subsequent interrogation must be done by a psychiatrist with a long experience on the line in order to really determine the effect or is the drug taking effect or is the subject just fooling around okay that's why it must be conducted by a psychiatrist psychiatrist intoxication with alcohol very common okay very common sometimes it can be a technique for deception detection similar to truth serum and narcoanalytical drugs alcohol inhibits the inhibitor therefore stimulating the control mechanism of the brain alcohol has the ability to remove the mast of sanity and is reflected in the age-old maxim in vino veritas in wine there is truth okay from the book Pathology of Homicide by Lester Adelson. Therefore, alcohol beverages are allowed to be taken by the person who will be giving a statement to the point of almost intoxication. At this point, the investigator can start asking questions and recording answers since the power of control diminishes. Of course, um, all of us have have tried al alcohol right and then because alcohol when you take it if you're a heavy drinker you'll get drunk and when you are drunk of course the truth com comes out okay that is why if you want to uh, if you are a shy person and you want to say how you feel to the girl or of course to the girl your dream then drink alcohol okay it thickens the face the questioning should start when the subject is in excitatory state since he is in the sensation of his well being and his action speech and emotions are less strained due to the lowering of the inhibition normally exercised by the higher brain centers once the subject enters the depressive state he will no longer be able to answer any questions okay but not too much alcohol because if too much alcohol then the subject will not be able to answer any question okay he will go to sleep <coughs> The confession made by the subject while under the influence of alcohol is acceptable only if he is physically capable to recollect the facts 
that he had uttered after the effects of alcohol disappeared. But, in most cases, the subject usually cannot recall everything he said or will refuse to admit to the truth. Observation A good criminal investigator must be a keen observer and a good psychologist. A subject under stress on, on account of the stimulation of sympathetic nervous system may exhibit changes which may be used as a potential clue of deception. And since just one or a combination of following signs and symptoms is not conclusive or, or reliable proof of guilt of the subject, their presence impairs further investigation to ascertain the truth of the impression. Okay? Okay, next. Color change. If the face is flushed, it may in indicate anger, embarrassment, or shame. A pale face is a more common sign of guilt. Dryness of mouth, tension, cause reflex, inhibition of salivary secretion, and consequently dryness of the mouth. This causes continuous swallowing and licking of lips. Excessive activity of the Adam's apple on account of the throat aside from the mouth. The subject will swallow saliva from the mouth and this causes the frequent upward and downward movement of the Adam's apple. These are indicative of nervous tension. Okay, As an examiner, you should take note of all of these um, marks. Fidgeting. Subject is constantly moving about in the chair, pulling his ears, rub rubbing his face, picking, tweaking the nose, crossing or uncrossing the legs, rubbing the hair, eyes, eyebrows, biting or snapping of fingernails, etc. There is indication of nervous tension. Peculiar feeling inside. There is a sensation of lightness of the head and the subject is confused. This is the result of his troubled conscience. Swearing to the truthfulness of his assertion, usually a guilty subject frequently utters such expression as, I swear to God, I am telling the truth, etc. Such expressions are made to make the forceful and convincing his assertion of innocence. Spotless past record, a religious man. The subject may assert that it is not possible for him to do anything like that in as much as he is a religious man and he has spotless records. Okay, So as an examiner, a veteran examiner, you will, uh, you will raise something in your mind that the subject might be lying because he insists that he has a spotless record or he swears the truth. Okay? Inability to look at the investigator straight in the eye. The subject doesn't like to look at the investigator for fear that his guilt may be seen in his eyes. He will either look at the floor or the ceiling. Not that I remember of expression. The subject will resort to the use of not that I remember of expression when answering to be evasive or to avoid committing something prejudicial to him. Okay? So those are the instances where uh, detection De deception detection can be used, okay? Those techniques, you can utilize it if you are the officer in charge. Next is scientific interrogation. The questioning of a person suspected of having committed an offense 
or persons who are reluctant to make a full disclosure of information in his possession which is pertinent to the investigation. Who is a suspect? <coughs> he is a person whose guilt is considered on reasonable ground. Okay? The perpetrator. He is the one who allegedly okay, committed the crime. Who is a witness? He is a person other than the suspect who is requested to give information okay attitude and conduct of an investigator so if you are the investigator you must have this um, conduct treating everyone with respect and in a professional manner so realistic words or expressions should not be used by the interrogator acting with integrity and honesty, not using profanity or abusive languages. The interrogator should use simple languages, not using excessive force, not being under the influence of drugs or alcohol. The interrogator should sit fairly close to the subject and between the two there should not be a table or other piece of furniture. Different types of criminal offenders based on behavior, behavioral attitude. Active aggressive offenders commit crime in an impulsive, aggressive manner. Okay? So these are the types of offenders. Okay? So, based on behavioral attitude, active aggressive offenders. Such attitude is clearly shown in crimes of passion, revenge, or resentment. Next is passive inadequate offenders. Persons who commit crimes because of inducement, promise, or reward. They are gullible and easily persuaded to perform acts in violation of the penal laws. Okay? These are persons you will, for example, the hitman, you will pay money because they need money to survive, okay? So based on the state of mind, this is another type. So rational offenders, those who commit crime with motive or intention and with full possession of their mental faculties. Example, killing with evident premeditation, okay? These are the psycho killers, okay? The sadist killers. Another type, irrational offenders. They commit crime without knowing the nature and quality of his act. Okay? Um, for example, those persons who committed crime uh, with their mental faculties absent, like Crazy persons, okay? Mad killers. Based on proficiency. Ordinary offenders. These are the lowest form of criminals. Career. They are only engaged in crimes which require limited skill. They lack the capacity to avoid arrest and conviction. Professional offenders, they are highly skilled and able to perform criminal acts with, with the least chance of being detected. They commit crimes which require special skill rather than violence. Example, pickpocketing, shop, lifting. Psychological classification. Emotional offenders. These are persons who commit crimes in the, in the heat of passion, anger, or revenge, and also who commit offenses of accidental nature. Non-emotional offenders. These are persons who commit crimes for financial gains and are usually recidivist or repeaters. Sympathetic approach is not effective. 
the interrogator should make a factual analysis of the suspect's predicament and appeal to his common sense and and reasoning rather than to his emotion okay these are self-explanatory just read it requirement for the admissibility of evidence obtained through interrogation section 20 article 4 of the bill of rights of the philippine constitutions states that no person shall be compelled to be a witness against himself so this is the doctrine of um, testimony against self-incrimination okay any person under investigation for the commission of an offense shall have the right to remain silent and to counsel and be informed of such right no force violence threat intimidation or any other means which vitiates the free will shall be used against him so this is the miranda right okay have you seen in the movies where a police officer when he points a gun to, to the perpetrator and he will say stop you have the right to remain silent everything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law you have the right to secure your own legal counsel and so on and so forth okay so i will give you assignments and you will study it and so that uh, you can apply what have, what you've learned here in actual life okay any confession obtained in violation of this section shall be inadmissible in evidence okay so that is why in the actual practice many perpetrators are released because the police officer failed to read them their miranda right okay that is the miranda right take note of that in compliance to section 20 of article 4 the person interrogated he is advised and warned about the following so this is the actual miranda right he has the right to remain silent anything he says can be used against him in the court of law he has the right to consult with an attorney and to have the attorney present during questioning if he cannot afford an attorney one will be appointed to him prior to any questioning if he so desires techniques of interrogation types so if you're the interrogator these are the techniques emotional appeal appeal to the emotion matt and jeff technique bluff on split pair technique the stern approach opportunity for lengthy time use the choices of methods of questioning depends on the personal and psychological evaluation of the subject by the interrogator the nature of the crime under investigation previous criminal records and the social educational background are checked and evaluated prior and during interrogation so emotional appeal the interrogator must create a mood that is conducive to confession he may be sim sympathetic and friendly to the subject the subject may be willing to disclose more information if he is treated in a kind spirited way another technique is the matt and jeff technique so in this technique there must be at least two investigators with opposite characters one matt who is arrogant and relentless who accuses the subject to be guilty and won't waste time in interrogation while the other jeff who is friendly sympathetic and kind when matt is not present jeff will advise the subject to make quick decision and plea for cooperation so this is the good cap bad cap tandem okay bluff on split pair technique so this is 
applicable where there are two or more accused for the same crime. All of them are interrogated separately and the results of their individual statement are not known to one another. While being under interrogation, the interrogator may claim that the subject was implicated by the author and that there is no use for him to deny participation. Stern approach. The questions must be answered clearly and interrogator utilizes utilizes harsh language and behavior. Immediate response from the subject is demanded. So the approach is that the investigator or the interrogator is firm. Okay? No nonsense. Strict. Serious. To create fear in the mind of the um, subject. Confession. Confession is an express acknowledgement by the accused in a criminal case of the truth of his guilt as to the crime charge of some essential thereof. So, confession versus admission. Confession is different from admission, although con admission includes as one of the species of confession. Confession is a statement of guilt, while admission is, is usually a statement of fact by the accused, which does not directly involve an acknowledgement of guilt of the accused. So types of confession, extrajudicial confession, which is uh, made outside the court, and judicial confession, confessions which are made inside the court or within the trial. Extrajudicial confession. This is a confession made outside of the court prior to the trial of the case. An extrajudicial confession made by an accused shall not be sufficient ground for conviction. Corpus delicti means the body of the crime, of the fact of specific loss or injury sustained. It may be necessarily be the body of the crime, but may consist fact circumstance tending to corroborate to confession. Types of extrajudicial confession, voluntary extrajudicial confession or involuntary extrajudicial confession. Voluntary extrajudicial confession. The confession is voluntary when the accused speak on his free will and accord without in inducement of any kind and with, with a full and complete knowledge of the nature and consequence of the confession. And when the speaking is so free from influence affecting the will of the accused at the time the confession was made that it rendered it admissible in evidence against him. So when you say voluntary, so there is free will on the part of the subject. He was not forced, was not... Um, there was no fear induced to him, okay? By the way, students, um, the source of my lecture is the book of Pedro Solis, okay? He is a Filipino expert in legal medicine. I have a soft copy uh, of his book, okay, from the internet. And I will be giving it to you. I will upload it in our team. Okay. By the way, the team, Microsoft team, is our official platform of instruction. However, uh, I find it convenient because before this Microsoft team, I already have platform of instructions like uh, Google Forms for my exams and Google Classroom for my discussions. Also, uh, the the president of this of this class, 
should make a group chat where I can message you directly okay of any important details so this is our official platform of instruction but I will add you I will create a Google classroom for you students and the exam my exam will be on Google form depending I will talk with Sir Chris the IT expert because I find it convenient okay and I'll be the one making the grade so doesn't matter if the exam is conducted here in Microsoft team or in Google forms okay and of course I will be uploading videos also in my YouTube channel okay please subscribe and like my YouTube I also have a Twitter account I also post notes there and instructions so add me okay uh, I will be posting everything in Microsoft Teams the links of my other accounts and I will be message messaging you in messenger uh, for any updates or instructions that I will be giving okay okay let's continue so voluntary extrajudicial confession by the word voluntary there is no forcing there is no inducement of fear um, it is done freely by the subject or the perpetrator okay involuntary extrajudicial confession confession obtained through force threat jurors or anything influencing the voluntary act of the confession confession obtained from defendant by means of force and violence is null and void and cannot be used against him at the trial okay so all confessions which are through intimidation through violence okay through force is inadmissible at the trial so it is useless because it is in the legal parlance it is called the fruit of the poisonous tree so it is inadmissible in evidence confession made under the influence of spiritual advice or extortion is not admissible in court okay now let's move on to another concept of legal medicine the tokyo declaration okay this is very important in your study especially um, today due to the relevance of human um, torture or human trafficking so the Tokyo Declaration was endorsed by the World Medical Association in 1975 so this is quite old already but still in operation it contains guidelines observed by physician about torture and other cruelty inhumane and degrading treatment or punishment in relation to custody and imprisonment okay so the preamble it is the honor of the doctor to practice medicine in the service of humanity to preserve and restore bodily and mental health without division as to persons to comfort and ease the suffering of his or her patients so for the purpose of this declaration torture is defined as the deliberate systematic infliction of physical or mental suffering by one or more persons acting alone or in or on the orders of any authority 
to force another person to give information, to make a confession, or for any other reason. The declaration. The doctor shall not, shall not participate in the practice of torture or other forms of cruel, inhumane, or degrading procedures. Whatever the offense of which the victim of such procedures is suspected, accused or guilty, and whatever the victim's belief for motives, and all situations including armed conflicts and civil strife. Okay, as a doctor, you must not participate of any form of torture, whether mental or physical. Okay. The doctor shall not provide any premises, instruments, substances, or knowledge to aid the practice of torture or other forms of cruel inhumane treatment or to weaken the ability of the victim to resist such treatment. The doctor shall not be present during any procedure during which torture or, or other forms of cruel inhumane treatment is used. A doctor must have complete clinical liberation in deciding upon the care for a person for whom he or she is medically responsible. Where a prisoner refuses nourishment and is considered by the doctor as capable of forming an unimpaired and rational judgment, shall not be fed artificial. Okay? The World Medical Association will support and should encourage the international community, the national medical associations, and fellow doctors to support the doctor and his or her family during threats resulting from, resulting from a refusal to condone the use of torture. Okay, This is a very important um, provision of law. Okay? You must review this Tokyo Declaration. Even though this is an old law or an old protocol, but still it is operational due to its relevancy, okay, and importance. So take note of the provisions of the Tokyo Declaration. Read the provision. Download the no the protocol. Okay, print the protocol. Judicial, next, next topic. Judicial confession. So, this is the confession of an accused in court. It is conclusive upon the court and may be considered to be a justifying condition to criminal liability. A plea of guilty when formally entered on charge is sufficient to bear a conviction of any offense even a capital one without further proof section 2 rule 129 of the rules of court judicial admissions okay by judicial admissions it connotes that such admissions was made during the course of the trial admissions made the part admissions made by the parties in the pleadings or in the course of the trial or other proceedings do not require proof and cannot be denied unless previously shown to have been made through palpable mistake okay once confessions are made in open court they are um it has already weight okay the weight of its uh, uh, evidence is heavy already to prove the innocence or the to prove the commission of the crime okay now let's move on to another um, topic which is the medical legal aspects of identity okay so take note of the discussions previously especially the important um, 
topics like the Miranda rights, the Tokyo Declaration, the different uh, types of deception detection, okay? Especially the definition of legal medicine, okay? It will come out in the exam. And also take note of other relevant uh, topics that uh, we will be dis that we will discuss along the way, which is related to our discussion uh, before. Okay, I will be giving you notes also. Aside from this uh, PowerPoint presentation, I will be giving you notes and assignments. Okay. I will just coordinate with the dean's office and with the IT expert, Dr. Chris. Okay? So, let's continue. Medical legal aspect of identification. So, identification is the determination of individuality of a person or things. The identity of the offender and that of the victim must be established. Otherwise, it will be a ground for the dismissal of the charge of acquittal of the accused. The identification of the person missing or presumed dead will facilitate settlement and of the state, retirement, insurance, and other social benefits. Identification resolves the anxiety of the next of kin other relatives and friends as to the whereabouts of the missing person or victim of the criminal act. Identification may be needed in some transactions like cashing of checks, entering of premises, delivery of parcels in post office, sale of property, release of dead bodies of relatives, and so on and so forth. Rules and personal identification. Law of multiplicity of evidence in identification. So, number of points of similarities and dissimilarities. So, you examine if there are similar similarities or dissimilar dissimilarities and then you take note. So, the more similarities the stronger the evidence of identification okay or the similarity so it means that it is not that person because multiplicity of evidence in ide identification contemplates uh, multiple similarities or d similarities value of the different points of identification Visual recognition by relative or friend, maybe he has less value as compared with fingerprint or dental comparison. The longer the interval between the death and the examination of the remain for, for purposes of identification, okay? So, you must also consider the length of time. Okay, the interval between the time of death and the time of identification because okay, there are only uh, probably days before putrefaction or decomposition will occur. So, method of identification by comparison. Identification criteria recovered during investigation versus, versus record available in the file, like latent fingerprint, dental finding, and etc. By exclusion, if two or more persons have to be identified and all but one is not yet identified. Identification of person, two types. Those which laymen use to identify, those which are based on scientific knowledge. Ordinary method of identification. Two types again. Characteristics. 
which may easily be changed, characteristics we not, which may not be easily changed. Okay. So, characteristics that may be changed, the growth of hair, clothing, frequent place of visit, grade of profession, body armaments, or body ornamentation. Characteristics that may not be changed, mental memory, speech, gait. Is it a toxic, cerebellar, cows, paritic, spastic, frog, waddling, pistinating gait, mannerism, hand and feet complexion, changes in the eyes, faces, left or right handedness, degree of nutrition. Okay, you must take note of these uh, things characteristics that may not be may not be changed easily okay if you have uh, again students because uh, I know this is very boring for you especially this my presentation alone at this moment in time is more than one hour already and I know your attention span is very minimal so again, you can um, ask questions or you can post this uh, presentation and then review the notes that I, I will give you. Okay? Or you can message me directly. Or you can discuss it with your classmates. Or you can ask your friends and classmates. I know you have many friends already in the higher years. And maybe some of you are my students already in BS Bio, okay, in leadership and management or in medical ethics, okay. So just bear with me and if you have any questions, feel free to ask, okay. I will accommodate, I will try to accommodate all your questions, okay. Okay, let's continue. Points of identification applicable to both living and dead before onset of decomposition. Occupational marks. Race, the color of the skin, the feature of the face, shape of the skull. Stature. Permanent tattoo marks. Weight. Deformities. Congenital or acquired, birth marks, crib, moles, scars, tribal marks, okay? As, a, as an investigator, you must take note of all of this for identification purposes. Anthropometry, Bertillon system. Founder Alphonse Bertillon, the father of anthropometry. Okay, that's his, that's the picture of the father of anthropometry, Mr. Alphonse, the founder of the Bertillon system or the anthropometry system. Okay, principle behind. It is based on the principle that after the age of 21 years old, years old the dimensions of skeleton remain unchanged and also the ratio in size of different parts to one another varies considerably in different individuals so it um, connotes that when you reach a certain age a person's uh, bone structure remains permanent already it will be permanent after reaching the age of 21. So the basically the Bertillon system um, contemplates the in, uh, the structural integrity of the person. Okay. 
as you can see in the picture the person is measured this is one way of identification okay the height the length of the arm length of the feet the length of the legs the circumference of the head okay all of these are taken into consideration so in this picture again the length or the circumference of the head is measured because it because after reaching the age of 21 the bone structure becomes permanent so the gait is measured the complete height the length of the fingers the length of the hand the spine the elbows okay everything is taken into consideration okay the span of the arm the length of your legs your thigh your foot okay your knee your wingspan as such it is applicable only for adults okay because after you reach the age of 21 basically in law you are an adult in the philippines the age of majority is 18 once you reach the age of 18 you are considered an adult already in law data to be recorded descriptive data such as color of hair eyes complexion shape of the nose ears chin etc body marks such as moles scar tattoos marks body measurement height anterior posterior diameter of the head and trunk the span of out of stretch arms the length of left middle finger little finger forearm foot length and breadth of right ear and color of left iris so this is just a matter of reading okay all of this can be found in the book of pedro solis i will be giving it to you my dear students different individual have different body measurement okay of course because all of us are unique so all of us has our own body measurement but the Bertillon system contemplates that after reaching the age of 21 your body or bone structure becomes permanent already okay the photographs of a front view of the head and a profile view of the right side of the head are also taken as a sole means of identification photographs are not always reliable and there may be a source of error even when they are inspected by expert this system has been replaced by ducti dactylography or fingerprint reading okay Portrait Parlay The following basic requirements must be included in the vertebral description General impression, type, personality, apparent social status, age, sex, race or color, height, weight Built Is the person thin, slender, medium or stout? Posture Is he erect? slouching does he have round shoulders head the size of the head the shape of the head hair the color the length is he bald face the general impression forehead is it high is it low bulging or receding eyebrows is it brushy or thin shaped is there a mustache is the mus the length of the mustache the color the shape take thought of it 
the ears, the size, the shape, the size of the lobe, angle set, angle of the set, okay? As an investigator, you must take note of all of this. The eyes, is it small, is it medium or large? The color, is the person wearing eyeglasses? The cheeks, is it high, is it low? Is it prominent medium cheekbones, flat or sunken? The nose, is it short, medium or big, or long straight, aquiline or flat or pug? The mouth, is it wide, small or medium, general impression? The lips, the shape, is it thick? What's the color of the lips? Teeth, the shade, the condition, the defect, missing elements, chin, size, shape, general impression, the jaw, the length, shape, lean, heavy, or medium. Okay, you must take note of all of these body parts for the easy identification of a person neck the shape of the neck thickness the length is, is there an adam's apple the shoulder the width and shape the wrist the size the shape okay the hands the length the size hair the condition of the palms the fingers, the length, the thickness, stains, shape of nails, condition of the, f the nails, arms, is it long, medium or short, muscular, normal or thin, the thickness of the wrist, the feet, the size, is there any deformities, okay, should take note. Now, let's go to the extrinsic factors in identification. The extrinsic. Because what we discussed um, before this are the intrinsic. Now, we go to the extrinsic factors. Ornamentations. Does the person wear a ring, bracelet, a necklace, a hairpin, earrings, lapel, etc.? course if we see a wedding ring we assume that the person is married right next personal belongings letters wallets driver's license residence certificate personal cards and etc wearing of apparels tailor marks laundry marks printed name of owner the size the style and texture the footwear, the socks, okay? Foreign bodies, dust in clothing, the serum in the ears, the nail, scrapping, may you show occupation, place of residence or work, habit, etc. And then identification by close friends and relatives. Identification records on file at the place, at the police department or immigration, the bureaus, hospitals, etc. Identification photographs, okay? You must take note of all of this in order to properly identify the person. Okay? Now, um, we will cut our discussion because it's two hours already i think but um uh take note of the concepts that we have discussed okay because uh these concepts are can be found in the book or notes that i will give and then i will add you in the other platform that i used for teaching for convenience purposes, okay? Uh, because the Microsoft team 
uh, I find it very hard to maneuver. Okay, but officially, officially, the Microsoft team is our official platform of instruction. Okay, however, um, we can use or we can utilize other form of instruction because these are these are all for you guys. Okay. And especially the exams, it is convenient for me to give the exam through Google Forms because I can print the result directly and will know your grades. And in, in Google Classroom, I can monitor the discussion. Okay. And the videos, I'll be uploading this. Um, this PowerPoint presentation in my YouTube channel so please subscribe and like also and I will be posting notes or updates through Twitter okay and you can also add me in Facebook but in Facebook uh, I only utilize it for personal use okay and you should create a group chat also Okay, take note, the president of this class, create a group chat, add all your classmates, and then add me so that I can message important, uh, important updates, important details. Okay, so thank you and we will be discussing other topics after this. Okay. Thank you and God bless.